Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Moon Village Association and the Cyprus Space Exploration Organization, we warmly welcome you to the first online Global Moon Village Workshop and Symposium. We have a great lineup for you for the next two days. Before we get started, we would like to thank our sponsors, Lockheed Martin, our silver sponsor, and Spacebit, our bronze sponsor. Our media sponsor is the Cyprus News Agency. Please don't forget to visit our virtual stands where representatives from the companies featured will be available to answer any of your questions for two hours immediately after today's and tomorrow's program. Without further ado, please let us proceed to the opening of the event with our welcoming speeches. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends from around the world, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. On behalf of the Cyprus Space Exploration Organization, I am delighted to welcome you to the first online Global Moon Village Workshop and Symposium. This symposium was to be hosted physically from Nicosia, but the global pandemic has necessitated that this symposium was converted to an online one. And as always, every obstacle may have a silver lining. With the online format, we now have the ability to host much greater numbers of participants and participants that would not have been able to participate otherwise. This event is now more inclusive and more accessible to many, many more people. We have over a thousand registrations from everywhere around the world. From Nicosia, Cyprus, where we host the control room and coordination of this event, we warmly welcome you. Space exploration, and more specifically, lunar exploration, is going through a brand new golden era. We're living through exciting times with, with breakthrough discoveries, and groundbreaking missions. Nations from around the world are planning new missions to the moon. Humanity is returning to the moon, this time not just for a visit, but to stay. In the next few years, we will see moon settlements on the surface of the moon. Science fiction will be coming our scientific reality. With this workshop and symposium, we're bringing you some of the greatest stakeholders from around the world with their news and announcements. We will be discussing highly important matters and looking how to engage emerging countries and how to also facilitate capacity building. Many of you watching us are young and excited about all this news. Yes, we do receive your messages on all our social media and we do see your warm enthusiasm from so many different countries. We hear that you want to be involved in this exciting new era. Many of you are wondering how we will be addressing all these topics in the next two days. We will be showing you how the young generation can be supported to be the scientists and engineers of the near future that will see all these amazing goals materialize. Cyprus, my home country, has a long history of over 11,000 years. It has been the cradle of civilization and a major center of commerce in the ancient world. Cyprus is located at a crossroads of three continents, a bridge between east and west, north and south. Cyprus has been pivotal in trade, culture, and cooperation in the ancient world and today a hub for international scientific activities regarding space. I can't imagine a better place to host this global event than, an, than our island nation, Cyprus, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Before I conclude, I would like to thank everybody involved in making this event a reality. The Moon Village Association, in entrusting us in organizing this event, all of CSEO's team here in Cyprus and around the world. 
and of course, our sponsors, Lockheed Martin, Spacebeat, the Cyprus News Agency. Once again, thank you, welcome, and enjoy. It is a distinct pleasure and an honor to address such a distinguished panel and so many participants who have, who have gathered virtually from all over the world on this special occasion of the first online Global Moon Village Workshop and Symposium held by the Cyprus Space Exploration Organization and the Moon Village Association. The participation of high-level officials from the UN Office for Space Affairs, the European Space Agency, China, India, Japan, is a testament to the significance of this inaugural event. We have known for a long time that the benefits accruing from the global space exploration initiatives are indisputable um, and touch on numerous fields of activity. Whether in science, environment, health, agriculture, communications, transportation, research, not to mention education. I can assure you from my own personal experience as permanent representative of Cyprus in Brussels, in the European Union and in New York at the United Nations, that Cyprus attaches great importance to these issues and seeks to play a constructive role in the discussions on the peaceful use and exploration of space. As regards the very specific subject matter of this symposium, I would like to echo the view that the exploration of the Moon increasingly appears to be a sustainable activity. When combined with the realization of the momentous impact of new recent discoveries, which lend credence, credence to the untold potential of this activity, it becomes clear that we all stand to gain substantially from furthering our knowledge of what possibilities may exist and how the international community can utilize them to actually what some of you have called humanity's grand vision of the moon. The catalyst of these worthy efforts is none other than the scientific community, including of course associations such as the organizers of today's event, the Cyprus Exploration Organization and the Moon Village Association. Both of them deserve our full praise and I want to offer my warmest congratulations to their respective leaderships for pushing everything together and to Mr. George Danos and Giuseppe Raibaldi for being true driving forces behind this event. By way of conclusion, allow me to invoke one of the principles governing best practices for sustainable lunar activities, which were adopted in March 2020 namely the need for gaining the support of as many countries as possible. Cyprus offers it without reservation. Let me therefore wish you every success in your deliberations during this symposium and welcome you virtually to Cyprus in the hope that it, it will be possible to do it in physical form in the near future. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, on behalf of the Moon Village Association, uh, I would like to welcome uh, to the fourth Global uh, Moon Village work Workshop and Symposium. Uh, as you can see, uh, we are welcoming from a virtual moon uh, behind me uh, that is an illustration of the future uh, Moon Village. And on my left side, you can see a lady astronaut, which includes our wishes for what is going to bring us the future. So today uh, it's a, a virtual uh, workshop uh, and therefore we are in a cyberspace, reason being COVID. Uh, last year we were uh, in Japan and we had a very successful meeting uh, with our Japanese colleague uh, and the, the meeting was supported uh, by JAXA. 
So let me start, uh, uh, first of all, mentioning that uh, this workshop will not be possible without the cooperation with the Cyprus Space Exploration Organization, which is acting as the local organizing committee and uh, the streaming and all the control room of the event are happening from Cyprus. Uh, the other party which I would like to thank is the United Nations Office for Outer Space, with whom uh, uh, we are cooperating on specific uh, session of the workshop. Then I would like to thank our sponsor, uh, particularly Lockheed Martin and Spacebit, uh, for the possibility of uh, uh, having them supporting us. Then I'd like to thank uh, CSEO staff, and in particular also Glavki Antonio, uh, which is the management support of the Moon Village Association, as well all the members of the Moon Village Association, which are contributing, providing a lot of uh, time and dedication uh, to this uh, goal. Finally, uh, I'd like uh, to welcome all the participants from all over the world uh, that I hope there are going to be quite uh, a lot of them. Let me recall that uh, uh, Moon Village Association is a non-governmental organization uh, created in uh, 2017. And the goal is to create uh, a platform uh, to uh, bring together in a peaceful and cooperative manner stakeholders being industry, uh, academia, uh, space agency, and last but not least, the public. So uh, members of the organization are individual and institutional. And uh, at the moment, I'm pleased to say there are 47 of them. Since last year, when we had our uh, normal, let me say, workshop, a lot has happened uh, in the moon related activity and in the world in general. Uh, but we are very honored and pleased to live in these times, since a lot of activity and a lot of moon mission uh, are going to take place. So I'd like to mention that the Moon Village Association has been very active in two particular areas. One has been uh, the creation, uh, the proposition of a common level playing field for future lunar mission, which I will discuss later during the workshop. And the other element is uh, to foster the involvement of as many countries as possible, in particular developing countries. Uh, the goal of the moon exploration and settlement is not only for specific country, but is a goal for the humanity. And this is what our organization uh, is trying to achieve. So I hope that you will have during the workshop, very enjoyable time, that you will learn a lot about what we are doing and what our goal. And I'm really looking forward to welcome you as a part of the association or even associated with that. And with that, uh, I will wish all of you an excellent and fruitful workshop. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you to our opening speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, with these welcoming speeches, we are kicking off the first online Global Moon Village Workshop and Symposium. We continue with our first session, Highlights and Future Missions, which features keynote lectures from major stakeholders. Hello, my name is John Mankins, and I am the Vice President of the Moon Village Association. And it is my pleasure to welcome you this, to this first session of the Moon Village Association 2020 Workshop and Symposium here in cyberspace. This session will address highlights of future missions which are being planned by a variety of major space agencies and participants in humanity's missions back to the moon, uh, including uh, NASA, the Chinese National Space Agency, the Space Agency of Luxembourg, uh, the Romanian Space Agency, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, the Indian Space Research Organization, the European Space Agency, and UNOSA, the United Nations 
Office of Outer Space Affairs. I'm sure you will find it to be a very, very interesting discussion, and I look forward to it myself. Take care, and I'll see you at the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, it gives me great pleasure to join you today as we open the first online Global Moon Village Workshop and Symposium. Allow me to begin by expressing my congratulations to the Moon Village Association and the Cyprus Space Exploration Organization for the co-hosting of this excellent event. It is an honor to be here on behalf of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. We will contribute to various sessions across the program today and tomorrow. Today's event is well-timed. Exciting new chapters in space activities continue to open. As this journey continues, once again, lunar exploration moves towards the center of the picture. We have a lot to discuss and the world is watching. The exchanges we will have today, tomorrow and beyond, really do matter. They bring the global space sector together and have the potential to help define a new relationship between our planet and our nearest celestial body. This is a reality now. The future of lunar and cis lunar exploration is here. Multilateral platforms for dialogue between policymakers, regulators, public and private practitioners must be strengthened. Together, we have a responsibility to continue delivering results at that multilateral level that keeps pace with developments in the world outside of the meeting room. But we are not starting from scratch. We can already count on a well-established normative framework that is serving our community exceptionally well and has underpinned well over half a century of growth in global space exploration. Today, more of us around the planet are finding ways to convert the potential of space into tangible benefits for socio-economic growth. We have over 80 countries with national space agencies. As of today, UNUSA has always received registrations for more than 1,000 new satellites in 2020. This figure represents nearly one in 10 of all objects launched since 1957, and we still have some way to go for this year. Simply put, political and economic investment in space is at record highs. Never has the power of space been understood by so many as it is today. So how did the international community ensure we could move so far, so fast? For that, we must look at the UN Outer Space Treaty. This instrument remains the bedrock of international space activities. Many of the key pillars of successful international cooperation in space are built upon the OST, and it, is, it has allowed us to establish rules of the road that continue to this day. For example, here at UNUSA, one role that sits at the heart of the contribution the UN makes in space is facilitating information sharing between actors. With the OST and then through the Registration Convention, such practices are now common amongst actors. Information sharing is fundamental to building trust, transparency and confidence that underpin a stable, secure and sustainable use of the space environment. As the number and variety of stakeholders conducting activities in space grows, we must ensure the basic idea of raising awareness to the existing normative frameworks is not lost amongst the excitement. But of course, we must also ensure that such frameworks remain fit for purpose. Here in Vienna, as the home for space multilateral policymaking, we understand more than most that this requires healthy international dialogue. 2020 has been a challenge with COVID-19 restricting us in the way we could host regular UN copious and its subcommittee sessions. We have naturally been able to make some shifts in response, with UNUSA opening a series of online dialogue platforms in the past few months, including the upcoming UN UAE World Space Forum. 
but discussion events in the wider space community, such as this one, have been more crucial than ever in recent times to provide platforms for international discussion. This is good news, as we have a lot of work to do with lots of points to discuss. These exciting chapters of lunar exploration opening up have put many issues on the international discussion table. Indeed, defining and delivering a sustainable future for lunar exploration will rest on finding common ground on a range of issues. To take some examples, the need for conversations and dialogue on resource extraction continue to climb up our collective to-do list. Defining what the future of interoperability in lunar and cis-lunar exploration looks like is another core element that we, as a community, need to realize in practice. Likewise, considering both the how and the what in terms of the future of information sharing between space actors is a key component that we need to settle. The list goes on, but as we press ahead with dialogue on the technical and policy aspects of new exploration undertakings, we should not lose sight of the social elements as well. With increased activity on the lunar surface, how we, as a global community, celebrate and protect the past, present and future of lunar exploration is another big question that we must find the right answer to as we continue this journey together. One thing that remains just as clear today than ever before is that we all still agree on the destination, a prosperous, sustainable and peaceful future for space exploration. As with most things in life, it is not always the destination, but the journey that counts. As the Director of the Office for Outer Space Affairs, I am proud to say that the UN has have been walking this journey with you all since our office establishment in 1958. Today, as we come together for two days of discussion and exchange, you can rest assured that UNUSA is more committed than ever in doing our part to making sure we reach this destination together, one giant leap at a time. Thank you. Greetings from NASA. My name is Mike Gold, and I'm the Acting Associate Administrator for the Office of International and Interagency Relations. Creating Moon Village begins with a lot of work here on Earth. I would like to begin by thanking Giuseppe Ribalde, Mark Sundahl, and everyone who helped make this dialogue possible. I was an active participant in the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group, and like that group, I believe the Moon Village Association can help tackle important policy issues in a unique and constructive way. No matter where you are in the world, you can look up at night and quite clearly see NASA's goal, the moon. As you're all probably aware, we are in the midst of the Artemis program, which has dual goals, to land the first woman and the next man on the moon, and of equal importance, to create a sustainable and permanent presence on the lunar surface. We are building the mighty SLS rocket, which will launch the Orion capsule, the spacecraft that will take our astronauts to the moon. Moreover, we're partnering with the private sector to build human landing systems that will carry NASA and partner nation astronauts to the lunar surface. We're also building the Gateway, an orbital outpost around the moon, which will provide the infrastructure to ensure that this time we're going to the moon to stay. Artemis is dramatically different than Apollo in many ways, but the single word that best captures the difference between the two programs is diversity. We begin with diversity of people. As the very name Artemis, the twin sister of Apollo, indicates, the Artemis Astronaut Corps will represent all of America. Beyond the US, there will be a diversity of nations. Whereas Apollo was implemented nearly entirely by America, Artemis will harness the broadest and most diverse international human space exploration coalition in history. The Gateway will be the physical manifestation of this robust global partnership, with ESA providing large habitat and refueling element, Canada contributing robotics, and Japan building critical environmental control and life support systems, as well as batteries to power this singular facility. Finally, 
there is diversity of organizations. As opposed to Apollo, which was a purely governmental operation, now we have a robust private sector that Artemis will leverage via public-private partnerships to enhance capabilities, efficiency, and affordability. Again, we're working with the private sector for the last leg of the Artemis journey to the surface of the moon, and we're also working with commercial providers to resupply the gateway. And I know that when it comes to public-private partnerships, there is much more in our future. The bottom line is we're going to the moon, and we're going to the moon to stay, which is why it's more important than ever for the world to adopt principles to ensure that this exciting new era of space exploration is conducted in a peaceful and transparent fashion. A few weeks ago, the United States joined with seven other nations to sign the Artemis Accords, a series of principles to ensure that as we execute the plans that I just described, that the United States and partner nations do so in a manner that implements our obligations under the Outer Space Treaty, the Registration Convention, and other multilateral agreements. Moreover, the Accords contain several other principles, such as the free, open, and public release of scientific data and interoperability that are very much in the spirit of the Outer Space Treaty and are norms of behavior that NASA has practiced for decades. As a society and as a species, we must strive to do better as we go to space, which is why I greatly appreciate the principles that are being proposed by the Moon Village Association. We must come together as a world to support transparency and clear communication between nations. Transparency is a theme throughout both the MVA principles and the Artemis Accords, as well as the Outer Space Treaty, because fundamentally, what we're trying to accomplish more than anything is to prevent conflict. I'm proud to be a part of this effort and any other that will help us to achieve the twin goals of peace and prosperity for all of humanity in space. I also believe that the MVA can contribute in a unique way to this critical global dialogue. Specifically, like the Hague Working Group, the Moon Village Association is a forum that can bring together not only government officials, but industry as well. As I mentioned previously, private industry will play a vital role in the Artemis program. And this is true in regard to the field of space exploration and utilization generally. Unfortunately, our national and international institutions were not initially crafted with the private sector in mind, and our processes and structures will need to evolve to accommodate this new and exciting commercial era of space development. Again, this is where the Moon Village Association can play a vital role. Its experts group and other operations can bring the private sector and the government together, identifying common ground and synthesizing views that can then be shared at the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and in other international forums. For all of these reasons, I'm excited to participate in this symposium and want to commend its organizers and all of the participants. I'm especially pleased to see robust participation from our friends at the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, and I'm grateful for the leadership of Simonetta de Pippo and her staff. At a time when a virus is separating us, I know that space exploration will bring us together. The bonds that bind us together as an international space community are far stronger than any disease. And now, more than ever, the world needs the hope, inspiration, and optimism that lunar exploration will deliver. I look forward to working with each and every one of you to transform this dream of an optimistic future on the moon, Mars, and beyond into reality. Thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward to the rest of the symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that I can talk to you about highlights and future missions, especially concerning the moon. Space. Space is a bridge over troubled water. What does it mean? It means that we are bridging earthly conflicts, earthly sanctions, earthly problems and power games, etc. And this is what the Moon Village is about. Originally, it was called multi-partner open concept, which means that each and every one can contribute, either public or private, science or exploration, technology, etc. And I'm very happy that the Moon Village Association is now providing best practices 
uh, which should give the ground for future exploration of the surface of the Moon in a sustainable way. ESA has developed an exploration program which covers uh, lower orbit Moon and Mars. It is called E3P, the European Exploration Envelope Program. This program includes also the development of European service modules, which uh, are there to uh, support Orion spacecraft on top of the S SLS rocket, which will bring astronauts close to the surface of the Moon. Uh, that means with these European service modules, uh, Orion will be able to go to the Moon, especially to what is called the Lunar Gateway. The Lunar Gateway is an outpost of uh, the Earth, where astronauts and cosmonauts may work for a longer time, and also from there they can go down to the surface of the Moon, or they can also remotely control robots on the surface of the Moon. And I'm very happy that I was able to sign a Memorandum of Understanding between ESA and NASA uh, to build part of this Lunar Gateway. Forward to the Moon is the motto we are using, uh, not back to the Moon because we don't want to go back and race in space uh, over 60 years ago, but this time go there together, go there in a peaceful uh, way and to work together beyond all the different uh, nations uh, on Earth. As for that, ESA is also um, developing what is called the European Large Logistics Lander, which will bring payload to the surface of the Moon for the support of astronauts and cosmonauts. And together with our Russian colleagues, we are preparing Luna 27, which should be a very special mission, also a robotic mission, landing on the Moon and drill into the surface of the Moon for scientific reasons. At the same time, we are looking also for commercialization. There are companies already developing communication tools, private companies, communication tools, for sustainable communication between Earth and Moon and back. And this leads me also to the Moonlight Initiative, which is part of our lunar economy thinking, where several directors of ESA, namely robotic and uh, human exploration, telecommunication and integrated application, as well as navigation, are working together in order to provide a sustainable solution together with companies uh, in order to develop really what could be called lunar economy. Of course, one ask, question is always ask, uh, when do we see European boots on the moon? When we are talking about boots, it should be not only boots, it should be really astronauts. And we believe that um, within the next decade, it should be possible to have also Europeans on the surface of the moon developing then together with other nations and other uh, agencies specific things to stay there for a longer period, to make research, to make science, to make also um, a preparation of further exploration activities. All of this comes together in the Moon Village and I'm very happy that we can be part of this uh, very important endeavor. I thank you very much for your attention. Good day to all and my friends from the space fraternity all across the globe. I am extremely happy to participate in this first online global moon village workshop and symposium and talk on future moon exploration and settlement. A little more than a decade ago, the Indian Space Research Organization launched its first mission to the moon the Chandrayaan-1. The mission had technology objective of a successful mission insertion into the lunar orbit and many scientific goals including the detection and distribution of water and other volatiles. We had invited the international community to join us in this investigation. We were fortunate to have a unique hardware contributions from the US basically APL, JPL, Brown University the ESA, RAL UK, Institute of Germany, IR of Sweden and Bulgaria. We also placed a small moon impact probe on moon surface to indicate our presence in the moon. 
Our second mission, the Chandrayaan-2, launched in 2019, had an expanded scope to orbit land and rover the lunar surface for continued scientific investigations. Though the soft landing could not be accomplished, the, other or the orbiter was successfully placed in a 100 kilometer circular polar orbit, ideal for mapping studies. The fuel advantage gained from the launcher translated into a longer than expected orbital mission life to pursue a more extensive mapping mission. Chandrayaan-2 brings in some unique capabilities. It provides very high resolution optical images from a lunar orbit platform. The first L-band SAR studies to search for deeper subsurface water ice, higher spatial resolution global elemental maps, extended infrared spectral observations to better quantify surface water, particle enhancement studies in the geotail, etc. I can go on and on. The first year observations from Chandrayaan-2 demonstrate these capabilities which will definitely contribute significantly to lunar science. We are in the process of systematically mapping the polar regions, the north and south for presence of buried water ice. The initial data sets are being examined towards quantification of radar scattering fraction and also characterizing the regolith dielectric constant. Other key analysis efforts include the modeling the full absorption feature near 3 microns for water ice signature, inversion of surface x-ray fluorescence to elemental abundance, mapping the distribution of inert gases in the thin exposphere of moon and the detailed lunar topography extracted from cameras on board the orbiter. ISRO is now working towards a follow-on mission as you know the Chandrayaan-3 which is expected to be launched in 2021. It has a lander and a rover carrying the same set of payloads as Chandrayaan-2. It will demonstrate landing and roving on the southern high latitudes on the lunar surface. It also carries NASA's laser retroreflector array LRA, for laser ranging studies. The next milestone in ISRO's lunar exploration program is a polar landing mission. The lunar polar exploration mission is now undertaken as a joint mission with JAXA. We are now involved in a phase A study for South Pole lander mission with a rover to quantify water ice resources in a permanently shadowed region and conduct in situ sample analysis. Today, the solar system studies and in particular exploration of the cis lunar environment is of great interest globally. These are exciting times with the renewed international interest to establish a human exploration program for the moon likely followed by visits to Mars. Both public and private partners are involved in this venture. ISRO has also initiated new programs to rope in private players in our solar system exploration efforts. The moon village concept which only a few years ago appeared as an esoteric far flung goal to many has now taken on a new focus and global interests have revived and increased. MEA provide a platform to support interaction and cooperation among the entities in both spacefaring and space aspiring nations. These interactive programs that Moon Village Association organize annually are indeed important milestones that brings the global community together to discuss and debate multiple aspects of an unstoppable desire for an extraterrestrial human presence and peaceful moon exploration. Coordinated planning of technology areas linked to transportation, communication and sustainability have to be augmented with the major policies and broad guidelines agreed among all active players to ensure a smooth, sustainable and inclusive program. I am happy to note that Moon Village Association is taking concerted efforts to bring out best practices for sustainable lunar activities. Moon Village Association is taking a leadership role in this regard. 
ISRO will be happy to work with Moon Village Association in further this goal. I take this opportunity to wish you all a highly successful and technically fulfilling discussion during the workshop and symposium. Thank you and my best wishes to you all. Good afternoon. My name is Mario Suan Pizzo and I am the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Romanian Space Agency. I am uh, honored to be here with you, to be invited to speak uh, when for the first online Global Moon Village Workshop and Symposium. I would first like to thank to the organizers, the Moon Village Association and uh, the Cyprus Space Exploration Organization for inviting me. This afternoon I will uh, try to give you some views about uh, space exploration in Romania with the specific aspects on the uh, moon exploration. I would like to thank you for your attention. ROSA is the National Space Agency established in 1995 and uh, it is acting as the public organization representative and coordinator of uh, space activities in Romania. ROSA is the financing agency for national uh, research and technology development programs, in particular for space, air space and security research. And uh, ROSA is also the national representative for uh, major uh, space international cooperation. As for the European Space Agency, the European Union, the United Nations, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, for NATO, for the IAF, IAA, and other, other, other organizations. ROSA is developing also its own center of uh, competence. The National Space Strategy is uh, oriented since uh, 19 uh, The National Space Strategy since uh, 2018 is called uh, the 3S the first S means uh, science and technology, the second S means uh, services, and the third one is uh, security. In this area, exploration, which is included in the first S, is, uh, has a long history in Romania. Uh, the first scientific payload has been developed in 1971 on board of an uh, intercosmos satellite. Then the first cosmonaut, the first Romanian cosmonaut, who was flying in 1981, Mr. Dumitru Dorin Prunariu. He did uh, several experiments on board of uh, Salyut 5. Then the, the Romanian scientists developed experiments on the space station Salyut, Mir, and also on the International Space Station since 1981 until today. Romania is a member of the European Space Agency and also a member of the ISEC G and a participant to the ISEF activities. I can mention that in 1923, Romanian Herman Obert was uh, the first to use the term uh, space station 
for his uh, will-like facility that would help launch astronauts to the moon and the Mars. The Romanian Space Agency is participating to the major programs regarding lunar and Mars exploration programs. And uh, also ROSA is uh, supporting the Artemis and the Deep Space Gateway program. Most of the present exploration projects of ROSA are developed in the frame of uh, the European Space Agency Space 19 Plus program for the cornerstone missions uh, Humans in LEO, Humans Beyond LEO, for Expert, for Say Space, and also the uh, robotic explorations as JUICE, as ExoMars, and the uh, Mars Sample Return. We are also develop projects for preparation of new human and robotic spaceflights, uh, which are mission oriented in orbit servicing and onboard technology. And uh, ROSA and the Romanian Space Program is open for cooperation in the area of uh, space exploration. Regarding the lunar exploration initiatives, uh, so first of all, I can uh, mention that we are considering the moon as uh, the external continent of uh, the Earth. And we consider that uh, moon exploration and utilization will enhance so the first uh, knowledge and scientific, observational and experimental capabilities giving uh, the moon specific conditions. Then um, industrial and manufacturing activities, in particular new technologies for uh, in situ resources utilization. And the third one, global security and planetary defense. Romania uh, is, since a couple of uh, days, uh, a part of the ESA-NASA Memorandum for uh, the European Presence in Lunar Orbit. The Romanian Space Agency is pursuing with the highest interest and uh, supports the initiatives aimed at the peaceful and uh, sustainable exploration of the moon. The Moon Village Association uh, best practices comply with the values and guiding principle of ROSA, which expressed uh, the support. I would like to thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, thank you for having me today. I'm Hiro Sasaki, of, uh, Vice President of JAXA for Human Space Flight Technology and Space Exploration. I'm honored to take this opportunity to battle Enjoy you at the exciting first online global moon bridge workshop and symposium. I guess on no one has ever imagined that we will ever have an online virtual MVA when we commenced the third MVA event in Japan December last year. I highly appreciate the effort by MVA under the leadership of the Giuseppe and also to Kipros Space Exploration Organization, who has hosted this online event under the challenge time. I recall when we met last year at the third MBA event. There was a wide range of themes discussed, including lunar surface architecture, cultural aspects, business development, and legal framework to realize sustainable human presence on the moon. The event marked a great success, co-hosted by Tokyo University of Science, Keio University, and Kyoto University. JAXA was also pleased to take part in this event. 
And from my personal perspective, the MVA had really become the catalyst to expand the community to a variety of people and groups, including the industry, academia, and ourselves as well. Last year, we had uh, over 250 participants from 16 countries from all around the world. And I'm sure there are more participating online today, so I'm very excited to address you with our latest update on our space policy and missions that are being laid out toward realizing a true moon bridge and even beyond. In June, the government of Japan updated in the space policy, recognizing the importance of the space domain as a frontier for cutting edge science and technology, and also as a driving force for economic growth. In particular, space exploration has been the emphasis in this policy, where Japanese expertise will be fully leveraged to take part in the global space exploration efforts, and will also bring the incapabilities from various industries. Speaking of the Lunar Gateway, Japan is planning to provide habitation and resupply capabilities based on the technologies acquired through the International Space Station program. Regarding lunar surface exploration, the next exciting milestone will be the lunar landing mission called SRIM, Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, which is scheduled for launch in 2022 to demonstrate the pinpoint landing capabilities. Following that, JAXA is also in cooperation with ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization, and other agencies for LUPEX Lunar Polar Exploration Mission to send a rover to the Lunar South Pole region. Targeted for 2024, this mission aims to obtain knowledge of the lunar water resources and to explore the sustainability of the lunar polar region that would contribute to the future lunar base. JAXA is also considering the, to develop the pressurized human rover to contribute to the sustained human activities on the lunar surface in the late 2020s. For this, JAXA and the Japanese company are currently conducting a joint research, and I'm really looking forward to see more assets to become important pieces to build a moon bridge in the future. In most of our missions, international collaboration is an extremely important event. As part of the global effort, let me touch on a little bit of the ISEC-G, the International Space Exploration Coordination Group. With the goal of the promoting globally coordinated efforts in human and robotic space exploration on and around the moon and even beyond, JAXA served as the chair of the ISEC-G more than two years until September this year, and now succeeded the role to our Canadian colleagues. In August this year, the ISEC-G published the Global Exploration Roadmap Supplement, Lunar Surface Exploration Scenario Update, to capture recent worldwide advance in lunar exploration planning. The updated scenario describes an exploration campaign and architecture elements for human and robotic lunar surface missions. In particular, I'm pleased to see that it, it integrates the renewed and emerging international and commercial capabilities to broaden av available options for future, future exploration initiative towards the Moon and Mars. It is also a very positive, significant indication that for the past two years, the membership of ISEC-G has increased from 14 to 
five space agencies across the globe. I believe uh, this includes interest and contribution from around the world will definitely lead to truly international collaboration in space exploration. In addition to the global coordination, having broader engagement with the industry and academia is also a key to realize sustainable exploration. Our effort in Japan includes various joint studies and researches with private companies in many areas, such as constructions, fuel plants, agriculture, and food. And outcomes of this research will also return benefits and bring innovation to our society on the earth. Since our last MBA, uh, I see the growing momentum in lunar activities in Japan. Many study groups were born in Japan where people, including experts in various fields, are actively exchanging ideas and discussing their shared interests. It is my understanding that MBA is currently working on developing the best practice for su sustainable lunar activities. The multilateral rule-making efforts are very, very difficult, but uh, mandatory for the global collaboration on the moon. I'm sure that uh, MBA's uh, neutering uh, grassroots movement towards such endeavors and this year's MBA event will further encourage the activities, especially in the African and Middle East na nations, to expand the international community and national and local com uh, communities interest in the goals of the MBA. I sincerely wish you all the success on this MBA workshop and the symposium, and I am sure that this one will mark another important milestone towards our exciting future. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to be with you today at the first online global Moon Village workshop and symposium. I would like to thank the organizers for allowing me to share with you what the Luxembourg Space Agency has been undertaking in the areas of space resources and lunar development and what is in our pipeline for the near future. I would like to begin by expressing my appreciation for the work that the Moon Village Association has been doing to support the growth and development of a sustainable society and economy on the Moon. The goals of the Moon Village Association and the principles made public in late 2018 match well with the efforts Luxembourg has been making both nationally and internationally over the last five years to support the peaceful exploration and sustainable utilization of space resources for the benefit of humankind. The Luxembourg Space Agency has been following the Moon Village Association from the outset and has contributed to the various workshops that have taken place. With its Space Resources Initiative launched in 2016, Luxembourg's strategy has always been to encourage international cooperation in the fields of legislation, education, research, innovation and long-term funding. In terms of legislation, as you may well be aware, in 2017, Luxembourg introduced a national law covering the exploration and use of space resources with the aim to start clarifying the situation on a national level. In parallel, we are actively encouraging discussions on the topic in relevant international fora. Luxembourg strongly supported the multi-stakeholder discussions of the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group which led to a list of 20 building blocks that could serve as a further input for a future international framework for space resources. 
We are also actively supporting and encouraging discussions in the legal subcommittee of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPOS. We are convinced that the principles proposed by the Moon Village Association will also provide useful input for those discussions. There has been tremendous progress on the sustainable and peaceful use of space resources over just the past couple of years. This can be seen by the impressive growth and high interest that lunar development has received recently from the general public and stakeholders around the world. We are confident that this momentum will continue thanks to improved knowledge, support for economic development and international cooperation, and various initiatives endorsed by different countries and associations around the world. Luxembourg is also proud to be one of the eight founding signatories of the Artemis Accords in October of this year. As we have shown in the past, we firmly believe and fully support the need for an international framework encompassing common practices and taking into account public and private considerations such as sustainability, interoperability, transparency and data sharing. One of the fundamental pillars of Luxembourg's strategy for new space and space resources has always been to foster cooperation with other countries and to work towards an international level playing field. The Artemis Accords endorse this collaborative approach. We are convinced that this will lead to valuable knowledge sharing and technical understanding of the key issues, which in turn will further discussions and progress at the United Nations. In the next months, LSA and NASA will further explore concrete opportunities for cooperation within the Artemis program, defining Luxembourg's contribution to the program based on our existing and future capacities. This in areas such as prospecting of resources, surface mobility and operations, communications and energy. We are also proud that the European Space Agency partnered with Luxembourg to create a European Space Resources Innovation Centre in Luxembourg. At ASRIC, we will set up facilities that will allow ground-based research on space resources for both public and private researchers from all over Europe, establishing a key international centre for space resource utilisation. ASRIC will focus on R&D, support for cooperative innovation activities including commercial partnerships with terrestrial industries, startup support, as well as knowledge and community management. I invite you to join the international kickoff announcement of ASRIC on the 18th November 2020. It is a very exciting time to be involved in the vibrant space sector. It is also really encouraging to have a multitude of international initiatives to address common issues. We need to ensure progress by considering different contributions for sustainable lunar activities. The Luxembourg Space Agency, together with its Space Resources Initiative and the European Space Resource Innovation Centre, is looking forward to continue and expand our cooperation with the Moon Village Association in the months and years ahead. I would like to thank you for your attention and I wish you all a very successful workshop and fruitful discussions. Hello, dear colleagues. Good afternoon. I am Carlos Moura from the Brazilian Space Agency. Uh, I congratulate all the organizers, the keynote speakers, and all the people interested in the sustainable way to access space and to advance in space exploration. It's an honor being here with you. The new technologies available for space activities are changing dramatically the way we access new space exploration missions. Also, we have a new perspective regarding the private and commercial component without forgetting the public sector responsibilities and support for funding larger initiatives. This venue is the result from a collective effort to go forward to the moon but understanding some lessons from early space race. This is one of the goals already set by Moon Village with the release in the near, near future of the best practices for sustainable lunar activities. As the American astrophysicist, Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson 
said in an open letter to Brazil, our Brazilian engineering should be more informal to the world. The invention of the airplane, the high innovative and competitive aviation industry, biofuel engines, outstanding marks in agribusiness, and so other achievements. Now, it's time to move these competences to space. We had some good developments until the 90s, followed of a period of some modest actuation. Some minor achievements from there, especially in suborbital flights, microgravity experiments, and remote sensoring. However, the efforts in the country are being redirected to set Brazil in the proper place in the next decade in the space activities. In this way, we have been planning new projects to push forward Brazilian space technologies to take part in the international space exploration missions. Once we join new international communities as MVA and the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, we are happy with the opportunity to share our perspectives and exchange ideas that can collaborate with the future missions. Brazil's association to the Moon Village is a reflex of the country capability to talk to any nation without bias. This organization represents the possibility of joint work in order to get to the moon and use this knowledge to make a better life to people in Earth, maybe breaking some of the restrictions we as nations set within each other. Moon Village goes toward the concept of Space 4.0, moving ideas to practical, practical initiatives like interoperability, relationship, and friendship. In the beginning, it will, it will be able to foster the initiatives of education, bringing STEM or even STEAM activities legal discussion, maybe even reviewing some of the old treaties designed when only public institutions were able to reach the space. Brazil is also very proud to start next year, 2021, private launch operations from its own territory, including foreign companies from various countries. And in 2022, a commercial microgravity launch capability by a Brazilian company. Once the space activities are increasing each year, Brazil considers important all efforts worldwide around the safety and sustainability of space activities. The work developed under every multilateral forms in corporates or in associations like Moon Village can provide nations the support to keep on our minds the guidelines that will be essential to guarantee a prosperous space environment in the benefit of humankind. We congratulate Moon Village for this first online event and especially the Cyprus Space Exploration Organization for this fabulous support. Thank you very much. Good luck for all. This concludes session one. We now have a short commercial break with messages from our esteemed sponsors.
generation detection satellites to detect and track missile launches. The U.S. missile defense system proved valiant today. It was able to take out several targets simultaneously in a test scenario. The National Weather Service has issued a severe tornado warning for the surrounding counties. Meteorologists, geostationary lightning mapper, and Doppler radar tracking a large storm system. The town of Newcastle, Oklahoma, is giving credit to an early warning severe weather forecast system for saving countless lives before a mile-wide tornado hit the town. 
ISS, Houston, over. Go ahead, Houston. We've just received an early warning from the Space Weather Prediction Center that their solar ultraviolet imager on Go-16 is observing an X-class flare and is now forecasting a major S-4 solar radiation storm. We're canceling today's spacewalk and need all the crew to take appropriate cover in the laboratory immediately. We interrupt this regularly scheduled broadcast. NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center has just released a warning of a major solar storm that may cause massive power outages across the Florida coast. Our purpose is found in the why of connecting to each other, around town and around the world. And the U.S. Space Force continues to modernize today's GPS satellite constellation with new, more powerful GPS-3 satellites that will help make secure, tougher-to-jam and spoof M-code signals available to our military forces around the world. Sector, this is Roanek. We are in position on scene and navigating to the ship's distress signal. Stand by for medevac. Sir, our satellite alerted us to an avalanche. It's imaging the area and tracking heat signatures of potential victims. Sending updates now. The State Department has stated hackers tried to attack U.S. satellites today, but failed due to artificial intelligence that actively defends and heals from cyber attacks. Today, at the United Nations, the World Carbon Alliance shared GeoCAP satellite data that shows carbon emissions rising over the East Coast. We have a target painted. Be advised, we are taking small arms fire and danger close to the drop. Sending our exact coordinates. Over. General, this is Air Force One. We will be connecting you to a secure line to the President shortly. Stand by, One. And our purpose is found in the why of exploring what lies beyond. Insight has passed through peak deceleration. Altitude convergence, lander separation commanded. Altitude 600 meters. Altitude 400 meters. 200 meters. 80 meters. 60 meters. 30 meters. 17 meters, standing by for touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. NASA's InSight lander has measured the first ever Mars quake inside the red planet. OSIRIS-REx is one step closer to completing a daring mission to survey and collect a sample from the asteroid Bennu. Scientists are hoping to discover insight into the origin of our solar system. Our why inspires us to protect, connect, and explore today and for generations to come. It's really something else. I can't believe we're here. Unearthed long ago, the why is what gives us our purpose. A mission to advance the human race into the dawn of a new space age. Mars Base Camp, this is Lunar Control. You are a go. You're cleared to proceed to Mars. Go make history. of lunar exploration begins. Commercial companies all over the world are aiming to reach the moon. Spacebit is among them, being the first UK mission to the moon. In 2021, Spacebit is sending the first walking rover to the moon aboard Astrobotics Peregrine Lander. It is a tech demo of a walking rover called Azagumo. During the mission, rover will walk and explore the moon, taking various measurements take full HD video and LiDAR scan data and sending it to the Earth via the Peregrine Lander. The second mission will be in 2023. During this mission, we will test the Wheeled Rover. It will act as a mothership, carrying up to four Azagumo, protecting Azagumo from the lunar nights and relaying signals back to Earth. The next mission will be in 2026. 
It will be dedicated to exploration of lunar lava tubes. The swarm of Azagumo will go inside lava tubes. They will make detailed 3D scans of the lava tube cave. We will gather data about lava tubes network. So the robust connection to Earth will be established and data will be transferred to Earth.
Space Force is using next-generation detection satellites to detect and track missile launches. The U.S. missile defense system proved valiant today. It was able to take out several targets simultaneously in a test scenario. The National Weather Service has issued a severe tornado warning for the surrounding counties. Meteorologists, geostationary lightning mapper, and Doppler radar tracking a large storm system. The town of Newcastle, Oklahoma, is giving credit to an early warning severe weather forecast system for saving countless lives before a mile-wide tornado hit the town. 
ISS, Houston, over. Go ahead, Houston. We've just received an early warning from the Space Weather Prediction Center that their solar ultraviolet imager on Go-16 is observing an X-class flare and is now forecasting a major S-4 solar radiation storm. We're canceling today's spacewalk and need all the crew to take appropriate cover in the laboratory immediately. We interrupt this regularly scheduled broadcast. NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center has just released a warning of a major solar storm that may cause massive power outages across the Florida coast. Our purpose is found in the why of connecting to each other, around town and around the world. And the U.S. Space Force continues to modernize today's GPS satellite constellation with new, more powerful GPS-3 satellites that will help make secure, tougher-to-jam and spoof M-code signals available to our military forces around the world. Sector, this is Roanek. We are in position on scene and navigating to the ship's distress signal. Stand by for medevac. Sir, our satellite alerted us to an avalanche. It's imaging the area and tracking heat signatures of potential victims. Sending updates now. The State Department has stated hackers tried to attack U.S. satellites today, but failed due to artificial intelligence that actively defends and heals from cyber attacks. Today, at the United Nations, the World Carbon Alliance shared GeoCAP satellite data that shows carbon emissions rising over the East Coast. We got a target painted. Be advised, we are taking small arms fire and danger close to the drop. Sending our exact coordinates. Over. General, this is Air Force One. We will be connecting you to a secure line to the President shortly. Stand by, One. And our purpose is found in the why of exploring what lies beyond. Insight has passed through peak deceleration. Altitude convergence, lander separation commanded. Altitude 600 meters. Altitude 400 meters. 200 meters. 80 meters. 60 meters. 30 meters. 17 meters, standing by for touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. NASA's InSight lander has measured the first ever Mars quake inside the red planet. OSIRIS-REx is one step closer to completing a daring mission to survey and collect a sample from the asteroid Bennu. Scientists are hoping to discover insight into the origin of our solar system. Our why inspires us to protect, connect, and explore today and for generations to come. It's really something else. I can't believe we're here. Unearthed long ago, the why is what gives us our purpose. A mission to advance the human race into the dawn of a new space age. Mars Base Camp, this is Lunar Control. You are a go. You're cleared to proceed to Mars. Go make history. of lunar exploration begins. Commercial companies all over the world are aiming to reach the moon. Spacebit is among them, being the first UK mission to the moon. In 2021, Spacebit is sending the first walking rover to the moon aboard Astrobotics Peregrine Lander. It is a tech demo of a walking rover called Azagumo. During the mission, rover will walk and explore the moon, taking various measurements take full HD video and LiDAR scan data and sending it to the Earth via the Peregrine Lander. The second mission will be in 2023. During this mission, we will test the wheeled rover. It will act as a mothership, carrying up to four Azagumo, protecting Azagumo from the lunar nights and relaying signals back to Earth. The next mission will be in 2026. 
It will be dedicated to exploration of lunar lava tubes. The swarm of Azagumo will go inside lava tubes. They will make detailed 3D scans of the lava tube cave. We will gather data about lava tubes network. So the robust connection to Earth will be established and data will be transferred to Earth. It's been a gateway between East and West, between past and present, between cultures old and new. Between tradition and transgression. Between ambition and execution. Between government and industry. Between nations, between giants and those who aspire to be, between talent and a 
opportunity. Between aspiration and foundation. Between science and nature. Between intimacy and community. Today, Nicosia is a gateway into the future. A gateway to new world-class developments. A gateway to exceptional investment opportunities. Nicosia, your gateway to the future. Good morning and uh, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. Uh, good to see you. Uh, I shall explain uh, the rationale, the status uh, and the way forward uh, for what we call uh, best practice uh, uh, for sustainable lunar activities. So let's uh, start uh, uh, from the rationale. Uh, as you all know, uh, starting from the end of uh, this month, uh, with uh, the Chinese, Chinese mission Chang'e 5, a number uh, of uh, mission uh, uh, will be launched uh, to the moon on around the moon uh, by many uh, stakeholders uh, in terms of states, as well as uh, uh, between industry and space agency. And uh, these uh, missions uh, will uh, have a number of different locations around the moon and will increase the rate. Uh, several missions might end up in a very similar geographical area, like uh, uh, on the South Pole. So that means that there is a, a, a risk, uh, not negligible, that uh, some of the mission might interfere uh, with each other. Uh, debris uh, might be generated uh, in a way that could prevent, uh, make more difficult a future mission. All of this uh, in a climate uh, uh, of uh, complex uh, situation internationally uh, could lead uh, to uh, accident. So uh, the Memory Large Association uh, considering the above and in particular with the goal of the risking uh, future uh, lunar missions uh, and increase uh, global uh, cooperation, uh, decided uh, to initiate uh, a uh, definition of a common level playing fields uh, for future uh, lunar activities. And uh, this is what we call best practice for sustainable lunar activities. This uh, uh, initial document was released uh, by the Moon Village Association uh, on last March. And uh, uh, the best practice have been the subject of uh, public consultation uh, for several months, uh, including several uh, public webinars uh, where uh, we have invited 
uh, number of uh, space agency representatives, as well as uh, uh, industry, uh, as well as uh, uh, a number of countries around the world, in particular developing countries. We also had uh, informal discussion in the context of a round table uh, uh, with space agency expert from all the continents. So the present status of, uh, of this document, uh, it is available on our uh, website. However, uh, just to be clear, this document will evolve in the future and it is meant to be considered as a snapshot where we are now and as an input uh, for further elaboration. Uh, I have to say that uh, we have received following the launch of this initiative, several very positive feedback by several space agency and other stakeholder. And this has encouraged to propose uh, being the Moon Village Association, a neutral informal platform, uh, the new uh, uh, initiative that uh, I'm announcing now. And that is the creation of a global uh, expert group on sustainable lunar activity, GEG, GEGSLA, in anachronism. The goal of GEGSLA is to hold informal discussion about uh, the definition of this common level playing field that we call best practice, or we, we can call differently in the future, and prepare material uh, in due time uh, to submit uh, to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space for further discussion and uh, deliberation. Gexla uh, will lay out voluntary standard related uh, to the best practices or similar, uh, as well as will facilitate the implementation by means of uh, specific action. Uh, for instance, by uh, defining interoperability requirement uh, that will be used uh, in order to really uh, be able to cooperate and, and, and be able to communicate and to interact between uh, different stakeholders from the East and from the West, uh, as well as encourage the involvement uh, of developing countries. There is a need uh, to define guidelines uh, for debris uh, mitigation in lunar orbit, uh, hopefully uh, in a timely way, since, uh, as we all know, uh, debris uh, in Earth orbit uh, have become a substantial problem, and we would like to avoid uh, that this is, uh, will happen in the future uh, in order to really uh, achieve a sustainable uh, lunar uh, development uh, uh, of uh, the humanity moving to the moon. We have to learn, whatever we have learned about uh, space uh, from the first uh, uh, years since 1957, we need to apply to make it, uh, uh, the moon exploration a success for everyone. Gexla will be therefore a multilateral informal forum involving experts from space agency, as well as other important stakeholders, such as representatives from industry and academia. The composition of GEXLA will be derived by a call for participation uh, to be released uh, by MVA in December in order to uh, increase the representativity and, and the global reach uh, of this group. So GEGLA uh, uh, activity uh, are planned to be initiated as soon as possible in early uh, January or during the first months of 2021 uh, with the goal to uh, provide first result uh, in March 2022 uh, in order to provide uh, this initial finding uh, to the uh, legal subcommittee of uh, uh, 2022. 
So the work of GESGLA therefore promise uh, to help to de-risk future lunar activity uh, and support the United Nation uh, in order to increase global cooperation by engaging as many countries uh, as is possible. Therefore, I'm very excited about uh, this uh, announcement that uh, we are making today to the world. And uh, I hope that you will also be excited as well and join us to be part of this very concrete initiative and stay tuned uh, on the, the future development and step of uh, this uh, uh, global uh, expert group uh, and follow the development on our uh, social media. So thank you for listening to me and I wish you a good continuation of the workshop. Have a good day. We will now continue with session two, Returning to the Moon, New Opportunities and International Cooperation. This session is conducted in cooperation with the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Good afternoon, dear participants. This panel is uh, on new opportunities and international cooperation. Uh, and uh, I want to stress a few things before giving the floor to the participants. The near future, we'll see a multitude of lunar missions uh, through the effort of both space agencies and commercial stakeholders. This concentrated lunar activity has brought with uh, in an urgency to agree on a common level playing field by clarifying existing principles of international law that will add in their implementations. The vagueness of the space treaties uh, presents a challenge to future missions and uh, could lead to conflict. Other issues must also be addressed to ensure sustainable lunar exploration and settlement, including, for example, mitigation mitigating the creation of debris uh, in lunar orbit and regulating access to lunar space resources. Most of our panelists represent industry interested to take part in the new phase of the moon exploration and exploitation. Moon Village Association is a multi-organizational institution, including mainly governmental institutions, space agencies, and industry, producing a package of best practices for sustainable lunar activities to help implementing the Moon Village concept. In the framework of the presentations at this event, I think the participants would like to hear about, uh, we'd like to hear about their priorities going to the Moon. Uh, we hope uh, as well to hear views on how the industry sees its implication in the implementation of MVA best practices. How could we ensure the worldwide cooperation and interoperability in the exploration of the moon from the industry side. And of course, other thoughts about uh, you have uh, to share with the audience. Um, the World Global Regulation the Regulatory uh, Institution of uh, the Space Activities is the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, working uh, through the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Um, Mr. Niklas Hedman, a very experienced person uh, who works for, uh, for the UN from uh, many, many years, uh, will uh, speak us about the space governments uh, in uh, this uh, new framework of activities. Mr. Hedman uh, of Sweden serves as chief of the committee policy and legal affairs sections of UN OSA since January 2006 as part of efforts to support the intergovernmental processes in the area of space activities that take place within the United Nations framework, the committee 
policy and legal affairs sections of UN OSA provide substantive secretariat services to the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, its scientific and technical subcommittees and legal subcommittee and related working groups. Mr. Hetman, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Doreen. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, attend this uh, uh, webinar this afternoon. And it's, I'm also grateful that the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, UNUSA, is uh, coordinating and uh, co-organizing this particular segment of the MVA seminar series. So I would like to share with participants a few perspectives of uh, governance and the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, since this intergovernmental body is the prime platform at the intergovernmental global level in governance of outer space activities for the peaceful uses of outer space. I can't move the... So, the committee was founded as an ad hoc body in 1958, and immediately uh, thereafter, in 1959, it received its permanent status with the General Assembly. Since all those years, almost 60 years, uh, the committee has developed the legal regime of outer space, as we know, comprising the five United Nations treaties on outer space, a set of principles, and other instruments, as you can see, on this slide. The latest instrument in governing space activities, it's a non-legally binding, but nevertheless, a political, a political instrument uh, called the Guidelines for the Long-Term Sustainability of Outer Space Activities, which was adopted by COPUS in 2019. The committee started off with 18 states members and uh, has reached the number of 95 as per 2020. And it also has 42 permanent observer organizations, and those are international governmental organizations and international non-governmental organizations. So IGOs or NGOs. Private sector entities do not have a status with this intergovernmental body, but if they wish to attend uh, deliberations of the session without decision-making power, delegations quite often include private sector advisors into their delegations. The committee operates with two subcommittees, the scientific and technical subcommittee and the legal subcommittee. If we look at the uh, membership complement of this intergovernmental body, uh, we can see that it is diverse. It includes the major spacefaring nations, uh, but also quite a, a big number of emerging space nations, as you can see on this slide. I have broken it down according to the five regional groups of the United Nations system. First, the African group, then the uh, Asia Pacific group, the Eastern European group, the Latin American and Caribbean group, and lastly, the Western European and other states group. The Secretariat of, of uh, COPUS, namely the Office for Outer Space Affairs, a few weeks ago received a formal application for membership received by Bangladesh. So what we know is that there might be 96 states uh, at, in, in 2021. COPUS operates with a very general mandate, and this is important to recognize. Uh, this is the mandate of the committee as you can see through those four bullets that was uh, created in 1959. And of course, the question is then, uh, how can this body continue working under this very general mandate, considering the technological advancement of space activities and also the growing of actors in the space field? Uh, there are views saying that, of course, we need to change the mandate because space activities today are not the same as they were 60 years ago. And others say, well, this is precisely the success of this intergovernmental body, that the mandate is so broad that the body itself 
has been able to absorb all those uh, evolutions and developments in the space arena over the past 60 years. And if we look at uh, a snapshot of the agenda items being dealt with in this intergovernmental body, ranging both from the, the main committee and its two subcommittees, and this is just a snapshot, there are more agenda items, but it represents really the framework of this intergovernmental body. What you can see on this slide are issues re really relating to how we use space technology for sustainable development and for environmental concerns on planet Earth. And uh, you also see items that are more concentrating towards the safety of space operations in orbit. And also, of course, a whole range of legal issues and concerns relating to the peaceful uses of outer space. And as I said, initially, this intergovernmental body is the treaty making body on international uh, space affairs. So the legal subcommittee has been vested with that mandate and uh, has created the legal regime of outer space. Also, the scientific and technical subcommittee in some extent have been involved in the uh, treaty development under the legal regime of outer space. When it comes to other instruments such as resolutions, uh, guidelines, and, uh, and other non-legally binding instruments, uh, both subcommittees and the main committee, of course, are involved in that development. If we look at the governance phases of COPUS, it's also interesting to note that it started off with the, the treaty creation. And uh, it started already in 1960 with the development of the uh, so-called legal declaration or the declaration of legal principles, uh, 1963. It was a General Assembly resolution, but the precursor to the Outer Space Treaty, which was adopted in 1967. And the latest uh, treaty, uh, legally binding treaty, is, as we know, the 1979 Moon Agreement. In the period after that, the 20-year period after that, uh, basically from 1980 to 2000, the uh, committee and its two subcommittees focused more attention on developing the set of principles. Uh, those are, as an example, within the principles, uh, you have the nuclear power source principles, which establish uh, safety uh, requirements in the use of nuclear power sources in outer space. And further on, from 2000 up till 2019 adoption of the long-term sustainability guidelines of the committee, we saw another movement within the committee as a whole in looking into the implementation of obligations and rights under the legal regime of outer space, in particular the treaties then, obviously. And therefore, the committee during this 20-year uh, mark concentrated on resolutions dealing with registration practice, national space legislation, the concept of the launching state, etc. And then now 2020, we don't know how the committee will continue dealing with its governance. So that is, of course, blank for the time being. But it's interesting to look at these 20 year marks and also to see that it started off with treaty making, legally binding instruments, then principles which are not legally binding, nevertheless politically binding through resolutions of the General Assembly, and then further down resolutions, but also guidelines which are nevertheless adopted uh, through this intergovernmental system. But it's interesting to note this fact that over the 60 years, uh, we, we started with treaties and then there has not been any new treaties since 1979. And with treaty, of course, I mean legally binding instruments. For the topic of, uh, of the space resources, which we are discussing now, focusing on since uh, the activities of the moon is very much associated with exploration, exploitation and utilization of space resources in the future. Uh, it's interesting to note that the legal subcommittee in 2017 uh, included on its agenda, an agenda item, and you have the title there in the, in the, in the headline, and uh, oh, since 2017, there has been a plenary consideration 
under this item with no uh, concrete structure in the way uh, how to, to, uh, to move ahead, but more or less more of an exchange of views among uh, delegations. It was decided in 2019 that in 2020, namely this year, the legal subcommittee should operate under what is called scheduled informal consultations in plenary. Under the co-moderatorship of Andres Mistal of Poland and Stephen Freeland of Australia. Now, due to the fact that we are facing uh, the uh, corona pandemic, uh, the session, the 59th session of the legal subcommittee had to be cancelled this year. And it has been decided by the committee and endorsed by the General Assembly only one week ago that the legal subcommittee at its 60th session in 2020 in April, and we hope that the session will be able to be held in normal mode, uh, will devote that session uh, to those scheduled informal consultations under this agenda item. So far, under this agenda item, we have a new document that was submitted earlier this year, and it is available at the website of the Office for Outer Space Affairs. It's a working paper by the Netherlands and Luxembourg and contains the building blocks uh, stemming from the Hague Working Group on Space Resource Governance. Uh, this document is available in all six official languages of the United Nations and obviously will be on the table for those uh, scheduled informal consultations next year in the Legal Subcommittee. We know that the Artemis Accords, uh, through its uh, provisions, will be transmitted to the United Nations and uh, we will see how that document will be made available. It could be in all languages and obviously then the Artemis Accords themselves will be provided as a document uh, for, uh, under this, uh, th this framework. And obviously we will then of course stand ready as a secretariat to provide any means for the Moon Village Association um, best practices in case uh, MVA should uh, wish to have that document also be available for uh, next year and the consideration in the legal subcommittee. Obviously, uh, all those uh, efforts uh, are broader than the specific space resource uh, issue, uh, as, as we all know, but uh, this is the item of the committee and its two subcommittees where really the, the, the topic of uh, resources and uh, uh, exploration uh, of the moon really is being handled for the time being. So the Secretariat is happy to uh, really provide any support in case the Moon Village Association would uh, wish to have the best practices uh, being uh, submitted to, uh, to the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space as a formal document, either next year or maybe later on, depending on how the Moon Village Association wish to proceed. So with that, I thank you so much. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you very much, Niklas. Um, it was very interesting to find out the framework in which uh, the United Nations works, uh, including for the Moon and for the future explo exploration and exploitation of uh, and utilization of uh, the moon resources. The next speaker is uh, Mr. Kirk Sherman. He's currently serving as a member of the senior leadership team at Lockheed Martin, supporting the lunar architecture program. Mr. Sherman served as the International Space Station's program manager since 2015 until June 2020. He was responsible for the overall management, development, integration, and operations of the ISS, and now dealing with the moon. Mr. Sherman, you have the word. Thank you so much, uh, Dorin. Um, good afternoon and uh, uh, good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be speaking with you today on a subject I'm very passionate about, and that is uh, human lunar exploration. I'm speaking you to, to you today as a space enthusiast, one who spent over 35 years of my career working to make this uh, future a reality. Um, on December 17th, 2017, 
the United States president signed space policy directive number one, which basically said that uh, we are to lead an innovative and sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners to enable human expansion across the solar system and bring back to earth new knowledge and opportunities, beginning with missions beyond low earth orbit, the return of humans to the moon and for long-term exploration and utilization, followed by human missions to Mars and other destinations. We plan to put the first woman and the next man on the moon in 2024. So today I work with Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed Martin is part of a team, an industry team led by Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman and Draper Laboratories. Uh, and we are working diligently every day uh, and every night, I might add, to build a human lantern to return to the moon. Um, this team of uh, industry leaders is strong and experienced, um, and we have a technical head start on our uh, on our vehicle design. Um, today, that vehicle is made up of three elements. They're uh, they are actually right sized, flexible. They're being developed uh, in parallel but uh, have strong integration from our, part, our industry partners. They have uh, one of the elements, the transfer element made by Northrop Grumman is, is pulling on their Cygnus vehicle experience. That Cygnus vehicle has flown numerous times to the International Space Station. Lockheed Martin is building the ascent element. Uh, it's actually utilizing much hardware and software from the Orion vehicle. And Blue Origin is building the descent element um, which pulls on their experience of the Blue Moon Lander and the New Shepard vehicle. Um, all these vehicles have, uh, have, have had years of design and testing already in their, uh, in their heritage. Um, testing is going on now. You probably saw here just a few short weeks ago, New Shepard flew with some terrain relative navigation sensors that flew and landed successfully, testing not only those sensors, but algorithms and computers. Um, We've, not, we've conducted a number of tests with uh, the ASCENT element using flight-like hardware and sensors and flight software showing docking, landings, departing from the lunar surface. This team is making great progress. We want to return to the moon with sustainable flights into the future. And Lockheed Martin and this national team is ready to support the goals of lunar exploration, a lunar gateway and ultimately missions to Mars. So why, uh, why are we exploring? I think uh, industry, I think nations, certainly the United States and others around the world, other countries around the world, uh, explore for different reasons. And I wanted to talk about that for just a minute because I think it plays really into, uh, into what we're doing about uh, best practices and why we need to work uh, together. So we, we explore for scientific discovery, human curiosity, we do it to drive technological advancement, both from an industry perspective, from a company perspective, but also from a, a national perspective and an international perspective. Um, we are doing it to create a multi-planetary species. Uh, and one of the most important reasons, at least uh, I believe, is to inspire future generations. I also think it's really very, very important that we expand, ex explore multinationally. So why, why is that? Well. There's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is space has no borders. So I've had the great opportunity to speak to many, many US astronauts, cosmonauts, astronauts from, uh, from countries around the world as they've come back to the planet. And, and to a person, they always say, you know, you really can't see any borders from space. They talk about how fragile our planet looks like, uh, how beautiful it is, and how we all need to work together. Just like the Earth from uh, a scene from low Earth orbit has no borders, neither does Moon or Mars. So we need to protect. Uh, we need to pro project this this feature uh, as we go on to humans exploring the Moon and Mars. Um, we want to bring more resources to bear um, than any one single country, either one single company or country could bear. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, Doreen uh, uh, mentioned about the Artemis Accords. I think that's just a framework for us to, uh, us to work together. And perhaps there is a broader framework that we can work together, cooperate uh, for, to create this future that we all desire. 
a great example, I think, of this cooperation is the International Space Station. Um, as, as it was mentioned, I was the, uh, the program manager for NASA for this for five years, for over five years, a uh, great honor of my career. Um, the ISS just celebrated the 20th anniversary on November 2nd of permanent human habitation. What a great milestone for us uh, all around the world. So for two decades, people have been living and working off the planet. Um, the first commander, Bill Shepard, Sergei Krikalov, and Yuri Gudzinko, the first crew was the first crew to live aboard the International Space Station and all still active in our space industry. Um, international cooperation uh, helps us all with international relations. It brings countries closer together. It serves as a kernel from which to grow a better, more peaceful cooperation between countries, not only in the domain of space, but really in all domains that countries interact with each other. Uh, exploring internationally brings a diversity of ideas. People with different backgrounds, different education, different cultures can bring ideas together, uh, ideas that can't be conceived of by one group, uh, and we can all make use of those to build a better future for all of us. Um, there's a domestic and political inertia. Um, countries have a harder time walking away from an endeavor if they're with their allies. Um, on June 24th, 1993, as an example, the International Space Station came within one vote of being cut from the U.S. budget. And I believe that uh, International Space Station passed that, that, uh, that milestone and now has passed over 22 years being on orbit and 20 years of human presence because of the fact that we are doing it internationally. It's clear uh, that all of us, it takes all of us, different companies, different nationalities, different expertises, different ideas to realize the future of human space flight. Um, and we are looking very much forward to cooperation, um, uh, both uh, industry and, uh, and, and as different countries to make this future a reality. I wanna leave you with, uh, with one thought um, in, in my time here. Um, it was some words from uh, an astronaut named Gene Cernan. Gene Cernan was on the crew of Apollo 17. That, uh, that crew launched from the Earth on December 7th, 1972. Um, and it actually departed the lunar surface December 14th, 1972, um, approaching 48 years ago today. Gene Cernan was the last human being to leave a footprint on the moon. And as Gene was climbing, uh, prepared to climb the ladder back into the, the lunar lander, Gene said these words. He said, uh, the challenge of today has forged man destiny of tomorrow. And as we leave the moon at Taras Litro today, we leave as we came, God willing, and as we shall return with peace and hope for all mankind. Godspeed to the crew of Apollo 17. And that's my hope for all of us as a future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, now uh, we will see a video of eight minutes of Mr. Alexander Dektyarev. Mr. Dektyarev is the general director of Yuzhna Estate Design Office, leading airspace company in Ukraine. It's a member of National Academy of Sciences uh, of Ukraine. Uh, he was director after graduation of, uh, from the Leningrad Mech Mechanical Institute, uh, director to work at Yuzhna Design Office where he works now. Since the beginning of his career, Mr. Diktyarev has worked his way up from an engineer to general designer, general director of uh, Young Illusion Estate Design Office. Uh, he's a consistent supporter of international cooperation between developers of airspace technologies and strengthening of cooperation between Ukrainian developers. Uh, okay, uh, under the guidance of Mr. Dektyarev, Yuzhne uh, company takes an active part in the Cyclone 4 development, Antares, Taurus 2, and Vega programs, the European Vega programs. So, um, Glavki, please uh, present the video of Mr. Dektyarev. Dear colleagues, my warmest greeting to you. I hope you are well and safe. Usually, State Design Office, 
during the NBA as one of the first members in March 2018. Since then, we actively contribute to many NBA activities. To this end, I would like to draw your attention to our presentation on Luna Transport Evolution in Section 5 that can uh, give you an idea on how serious our moon-related developments are. I would like to share with you some thoughts on more general but very important for our industry subjects, such as creation of the future lunar economy. In this context, the following key points need to be considered. First, governmental program and funding shape the lunar economy today. Second, access to the governmental program is difficult for many developers due to quite a narrow range of objectives to be achieved and strong competition. The third, most of the present business opportunities are related to support of the governmental programs and projects. Fourth, the autonomous lunar economy that does not fully depend on the governmental program can be built only after the exploration and development, mining and processing of the moon's natural resource. Fifth, objectively you can say that current process and the timing of shaping the autonomous lunar economy depend fully on the scope and schedules of governmental and international programs for the moon exploration. Six, we need to find possible way of attracting more commercial players to actively participate in making lunar business cases and in the global process of forming the lunar economy. Usually I propose the following strategy for achieving this goal. First, establishing a, com a consortium of MBA members and other participants on a voluntary basis for the following task. Elaboration of plan and determining direction of technology development based on the analysis of demand and combination of capabilities and resources of the members. Presentation of the results to the expert community and potential investors. Mutual fostering and supporting of the members' project to achieve their successful implementation. Attracting venture capital and or grant funding for implementation of the project and plan. Second, identify the most critical development works. Development and testing of the following technology and equipment for extracting and use of the multinational resource seems to be a large and promising task. Extraction of water for using in takeoff and landing vehicle power production process and for life support purposes. Manufacturing of construction material and creation of different structures on the moon. Extraction and delivery of the rare metals to the earth. To start with, the focus can be given to development of experimental technologies that have to be tested in the Runa condition. Uh, this will require to develop a prototype of the respective technological equipment and uh, a spacecraft for delivering of the equipment to the moon. In the long term, the laboratory equipment can be converted into the industrial one. Development of experimental equipment can attract new space companies in the countries that have recently joined the space club. The third, initial phase until obtaining prototype of the equipment requires for the implementation of project. The consortium can run without external financing, using the resource of its member only. For instance, using a useless resource to carry out a series of projects concerning exploration and the uh, use of the moon. Some of these projects were included in the next national space program of Ukraine, the main of which are 
He development of an electrical power plant running on solar energy for powering the lunar base. The power plant applies the innovative technology of electrolysis and can be used for the production of rocket fuel on the moon. Development of a CubeSat for making imagery of the moon from different positions, including measurement spectral changes of the moon's surface. Development of a solar and ther uh, thermoelectric generator for production of renewable energy by absorbing solar energy and heat from the moon surface. This project we also include in the Global Space Exploration Roadmap approved at the meeting of the International Space Exploration Coordination Group. Fourth, creating an innovation image of the consortium is the most critical for achieving success, which requires the coordinated PR strategy together with demonstration of results. Fifth, the consortium can develop technical solutions for uh, governmental programs, such as the Artemis program, and uh, attract new international members for cooperation and achieving the common goals. Sixth position, as a result, the consortium can get a, a recognition and become attractive for non-governmental investors. Due to the point joint efforts, the consortium can become an example of making business cases and developing commercially attractive technical solutions. Some business cases can become a strategic component of the lunar economy in parallel with governmental programs. To conclude, I would like to mention about international conference space technology present and future held in May 2019 under the aegis of International Academy of Sanotic, where one of the sessions was dedicated for the first time to the MVA activities. It was very well intended by the expert and general public, and you are kindly invited to this conference be organized by Yuzhne next year. I wish you all health, inspiration, and creative ideas. Thank you for your attention. Uh, it was interesting with a uh, lot of proposals made by him. Uh, now I invite uh, to present his uh, point of view, Mr. Uh, Ivao Igarashi, uh, representing Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, being the Vice President and General Manager for Business Development. Uh, Mr. Igarashi has been in charge of rocket development since the very first test launch of the H2 rocket. In university, he studied solar power generation satellites at the Institute of Space and Astronomical Science, which formed a turning point for him. So he joined Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, where Mr. Igarashi works ever since. Mr. Igarashi, you have the floor. Okay. So thank you very much, Darwin, and uh, uh, it's my pleasure to attend this session. So uh, I'm share sharing uh, the in my case too, I cannot bring my... So you have share screen down on the screen. If you move uh, the point... I will now try and...
Okay, it works. Okay, it works. Okay. So many people are accessing uh, this work. So um, yeah, thank you very much. And this picture shows uh, uh, NHS vision. Uh, and uh, I think it's just not much time. So uh, I rush my presentation here. So um, there are many elements uh, necessary elements for uh, uh, lunar uh, villages, uh, but uh, as a uh, NHS efforts, uh, I will present you uh, uh, two, two elements. One is uh, energy uh, system uh, using the ISRU and the uh, uh, transportation system. So now at first, uh, uh, for the energy plants, uh, I'm looking at uh, the uh, power of hydrogen. And, you know, uh, they say uh, uh, hydrogen exists uh, in, in the moon. And then this hydrogen will uh, stretch Stretch the area of space. And now, current range of business electricity in the real near geo, but uh, this uh, hydrogen uh, techniques uh, would uh, expand our area, our activities. And the key technology is uh, production, storage, transfer, and usage. And we, MHI, as a industry uh, we have we will have some roles to contribute uh, the uh, reality so uh, this slide shows uh, the concept uh, of the energy power plants uh, especially uh, uh, about the supply chain of hydrogen and uh, so uh, it uh, this plant uh, must be variable uh, for the activities on the moon. Uh, so uh, well, the the most important thing thing is uh, the the power uh, generating from this uh, plant and uh, uh, water uh, for human activities. And uh, uh, water may be, may be brought from the earth and uh, from the human solid uh, on, the, on the surface of the moon. And uh, uh, for the human activities, uh, the water must be uh, recycled. And the uh, uh, core uh, technology is this regenerative fuel cells. And uh, uh, create uh, hydrogen and oxygen, uh, and some of them uh, will be used for uh, 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 fuel or oxidizers. Uh, this, uh, I will introduce you the uh, efforts of uh, MHI. And the left hand side, Picture is the uh, NHS in house test module several years ago. And this is a uh, uh, test uh, for regenerative fuel cells. And the uh, uh, right hand side uh, drawing uh, is uh, a concept, concept study going on uh, with JAXA Innovation Hub. And uh, uh, we are now uh, researching uh, how to uh, realize. The system. And, uh, oh, and as you know, uh, we MHA has, has a uh, heritage of the operation of launch vehicles using hydrogen. And uh, uh, so for this operation, uh, we have uh, uh, autonomous launch control system 
uh, it must be uh, useful on the uh, plants on the on the moon or uh, beyond. Uh, and uh, for the uh, managing of the uh, hydrogen, minimizing the flood of gas technology is uh, research and we have a lot of experience. And there are many various uh, cryogenic components. And these pictures is a quick disconnect for hydrogen. And from, uh, from from this slides, I will introduce you the, uh, our current status of a brand new rocket, the H3 and the HTVX. Uh, these are uh, these commercial services uh, is uh, starting in fiscal Japanese fiscal year 2022 and and later uh, as soon. And then this HTVX is uh, now uh, developing, uh, develop, developing. Uh, we are developing this HTVX uh, for the uh, up now for the ISS, uh, but for, but it, it must be uh, used for uh, lunar mission too. So um, we are. Uh, we are now researching um, about the conceptual study uh, for the uh, lunar mission. And these are uh, three options uh, to the moon using the, our H3 launch vehicles. First option is uh, uh, two launch vehicles uh, for one mission. Uh, and the second option is uh, Heavy launcher uh, with L, L liquid working system. And third one is the uh, upgrade version of, uh, of the second options. And this is uh, our uh, case study, which is in house case study for the uh, surface of the moon uh, using the uh, LLB's uh, H3 heavy uh, compilation. Uh, we can uh, deliver uh, three or four tons uh, to the moon uh, without lander. So finally, uh, this is a summary uh, of my presentation. Uh, I introduce you, I present you the uh, two topics. One is uh, hydrogen use, and the second one is uh, uh, transportation system. And uh, uh, so, anyway, uh, for reali realizing the uh, moon village, uh, new technologies based on heritage uh, essential uh, for the new opportunity. So, that's it, my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Garashi. Uh, Yes, a very important problem, it's energy on the moon. What we do, what, for, what from do we take the fuel to, to fly around the moon, to fly back. Um, thank you very much. So the next speaker, it's Mr. Dan Hendrickson. He serves as the vice president of business development for Astrobotic, Astrobotic a lunar logistic company based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Dan Hendrickson leads Astrobotics Lunar Payload Delivery Sales and corporate sponsorship for the company's robotic missions to the moon. Prior to Astrobotic, uh, Dan served as a director of civil and commercial space systems at the Airspace Industries Association. During his time at uh, AIA, he was a consensus builder among a council of 50 U.S. space companies to provide the U.S. government guidance on key space industry views. Okay, uh, Mr. Hendrickson, you have the floor. Great, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the Moon Village Association for hosting this important and timely forum. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Dan Hendrickson and I'm with Astrobotic. 
a lunar logistics company based here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we were founded back in 2007 to make the moon accessible to the world. Um, we like to say that we've been a proponent of the moon before it really became a consensus position that the entire world was really settled to go to the moon. Um, so we're, we take great pride in really maintaining uh, that support over the last 13 years and have advocated for that uh, over that uh, decade plus time span. And so uh, because we were founded to make the moon accessible to the world, I think it's important to pause um, and kind of address why uh, we think that's an important and, uh, and, and uh, noble uh, pursuit for the space community uh, writ large. And so uh, the slide that you see here is kind of the, uh, the motivations that we see from folks around the world wanting to go to the moon. Um, on the left side, you have kind of the near-term uh, opportunities that the moon offers. Um, and I think it's important to remind ourselves of why that's such an important uh, uh, first step for, for uh, moving forward with, with lunar exploration and hopefully even uh, beyond that. And so uh, exploration and research, I think, are an important uh, low-hanging fruit for, for all of us in the space community to be pursuing. Um, there is so much that we have learned about the moon since the Apollo program. It is just a vastly different destination, and it offers so much new insight in, into um, planetary science and, and a variety of other fields as well. Um, for instance, of course, we've discovered that there's uh, lunar lava tubes. Uh, we've also discovered that there's Great Lakes worth of, of water ice at the lunar poles. Uh, so it's a dramatically different planetary body than when the Apollo astronauts visited. And so um, that alone, I think, is an important motivation for us to, uh, to go forward to the moon. And the moon, of course, also offers, as, as the last presenter was highlighting, an important opportunity to live off the land and really demonstrate that for the first time. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, to demonstrate, hopefully, that we are uh, set to become a, a multi-planet species in the long term. On the right, you can see some maybe more uh, medium to longer term applications that we see with the moon in particular. Uh, the opportunity to utilize the, the lunar surface or the lunar uh, uh, water ice for fuel depots. Hopefully at some point, uh, the rare earth metals might be a, an opportunity for mining in the future and then manufacturing with the lunar regolith. Um, again, these are more the medium to longer term, but I think it's important to note that all of the different uh, demands that you see here on this slide are really emblematic of what folks are telling us in the market that they want capability uh, to get to the moon for in the first place. Um, so they're looking for low cost lunar transportation as a motivation or, or as the, the means to get to these motivations that you see here on the screen. And so um, we don't necessarily as a company presuppose what the future on the moon is going to be, but rather we want to create bridges and, and ultimately you can almost think of them as railroads to get to the lunar surface to start to pursue all of these different opportunities uh, and try them out and see which ones have, have viability in the long term. Uh, because we think there one or more of these will definitely succeed. We just need to get to the surface and, and get going on, on the business of, of pursuing them. So we provide end-to-end -end lunar logistics services, and we're primarily focused in the near term on delivery. Uh, on the left, you can see our lander product lines. The Peregrine Lunar Lander uh, can carry about 100 kilograms of payload capacity to the surface. Our Griffin Lunar Lander is a medium-class vehicle that can carry 500 kilograms to the surface. And so uh, different mass capacities for different needs. And then on the right, on the right you can see our rover product lines, the Cube Rover, uh, which can carry about two to six kilograms, and the Polaris at the much larger capacity of 90 kilograms. Uh, these are really meant to address specific needs in the market. Um, so you can see, like, for example, the Cube Rover uh, can offer mobility for small payloads to get to the surface. Uh, it's ideally fit to, to be on board uh, vehicles like the Peregrine Lander, uh, and allow anyone. Then we have a problem. We see only one slide, the first slide of your presentation. We don't see the other slides. Oh, I'm sorry to, to hear that. Um, I, can you see the slide yes, now? now it's okay. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so just highlighting here the, uh, the services and the product lines. Uh, as mentioned, we have these rovers, and these really extend the capability of getting to the lunar surface and then providing mobility. Um, so vehicles uh, or, or payloads can have vehicle mobility on the surface. And we provide all of this in an end-to-end -end service. So uh, customers around the world can buy just the capacity that they need, either at 1.2 million per kilogram to get to the lunar surface via our landers, or four and a half million per kilogram on board one of our rovers, uh, which includes the, the launch and the landing, uh, and then the subsequent mobility. So we have uh, a variety of different product lines for a variety of different customers around the world. 
really trying to create that access for everyone. Um, so it's possible even for folks that have just a few kilograms to get to the lunar surface and start carrying out the activities that they have planned. So we have three books, three missions on the books right now uh, for, for this manifest of, of delivering uh, services for our customers. The first one will be next year in 2021. Our Peregrine Lunar Lander will be flying to Lacus Mortis delivering the first collection of payloads. We have 16 customers that are signed on for that first mission. Uh, one of which is NASA with the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. Uh, but we also have many other customers from around, from around the world. And I think uh, that is um, kind of emblematic of what the, the commercial private sector services can offer is the chance for the entire international community uh, to be on board these missions to be carrying out their, uh, their particular um, payload activities that they're planning. Um, so that first mission will be carrying um, companies, governments, universities, nonprofits from around the world uh, representing six countries overall uh, in, in one of those capacities. And so this will really kick off our service next year. Then in 2022, we are uh, sending our Moon Ranger rover, which you see pictured here. This will be flying on another commercial lander from uh, the, uh, Maston the Maston Company. Um, they're going to be going to the South Pole of the moon and we'll be uh, delivering our, our Moon Ranger vehicle uh, this is through the CLIPS program. So we're building this rover uh, as a payload to be flying uh, on board a, another lander. And this mission will be testing out some key autonomy techniques on the lunar surface. Um, in, in the past, uh, most lunar rovers have been command and control from the ground. Uh, we wanna test out some techniques um, to allow autonomy to take place for the first time uh, with space robotics on the moon. And then in 2023, uh, we're going to be delivering the Viper rover uh, on behalf of NASA. Uh, Viper is a golf cart size rover that'll be doing the first ground truth measurements of lunar water ice. Um, this will be a really important and potentially very historic mission uh, to gather those measurements for the first time to understand the water content that might exist at the, at the moon and then uh, also economically how extractable it might be for the future uh, to carry out the applications like we've seen from, from prior presenters here. Um, so this is a, a very nationally important mission uh, in the U.S., but also just a, um, an internationally important mission for anyone that's advocating for the moon uh, and for the promise that the, that the moon holds for us. Um, so this is a, a very exciting mission that will be flying in 2023 to the South Pole of the moon. And so um, just in closing, highlighting these activities, um, I want to further reiterate that uh, these services are really meant for everyone around the world. Uh, for all participants of the Moon Village Association and even beyond that, uh, there's a unique opportunity to now just buy capacity that you need um, and, and rely and work with, with other private companies like Astrobotic uh, to be able to have your payload delivered on your behalf and then to operate and carry out your missions. And so to that end, um, we provide a number of resources for our customers, um, including a payload user's guide, which you can find online. Uh, we also offer an interface design document, which you can uh, inquire with me directly to get a, a hold of. Um, we also provide payload managers to work very closely with all the, the payload builders uh, who are participating on our missions. And so um, this is a role that we take very seriously uh, because again, it all comes back to really creating access uh, for the customers around the world to be able to get to the moon and to pursue all of those different applications uh, that we see and think are, are very fruitful in the future. Um, so with that, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, very interesting presentation as well. Uh, we heard uh, things connected with the legal framework of the exploration and exploitation of uh, uh, the moon. We heard about the debates and uh, working groups dealing with uh, things connected with the future exploration and exploitation of other celestial bodies, including the moon, Mars, and we heard, of course, uh, the point of view of uh, the industry, different programs, interesting programs, uh, infrastructure built for the moon and how we explore in the future the moon. Uh, in the end, because we don't have too much time, I want to ask the participants at the panel about their comments on a proposal to organize a neutral informal platform that could be named Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities, uh, which goal would be to hold informal discussions about the best practices or similar things and prepare materials to submit to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space for further discussions 
and deliberations. This platform could lay, could lay out voluntary standards related to the best practices or similar, as well as facilitate their implementation by means of specific actions, uh, definition of interoperability, by instance, uh, debris mitigation in LoRaR uh, orbit guidelines, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et so, uh, a few words, so one minute for each of you to, to share your opinions about such a proposal may, that could be made by, by uh, the Moon Village Association. Okay, hello. Um, okay. I'm Igor. Um, yeah, I, I'm 100% I'm agree uh, with this uh, uh, best practices. And uh, uh, shortly, uh, I, uh, I hope uh, every, everyone uh, will uh, support this and uh, uh, make uh, conservative uh, for the uh, keeping the uh, environment on the moon and uh, and at the same time uh, it will be effective uh, for realizing uh, the uh, community community on the moon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dorian? Yes. Yes, it's Niklas Hedman here. Okay, uh, Niklas. Yes, uh, I heard your proposal and uh, I absolutely, um, if the Moon Village Association wishes to go ahead with uh, such a, a, a working group or working party with uh, all the stakeholders involved, including uh, private sector, I assume, that is absolutely, it's, it's a decision of, of the organizer, of course, to set such a mechanism up. It will, though, be outside of the intergovernmental framework, so it will be outside of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, but that doesn't stop the, the endeavor to have such a group and, and to outline more in depth the best practices, if I understand it correctly, and then it could be presented to uh, the intergovernmental body of COPUS, you know, at, at, at a time when, uh, when you feel that it is mature. So uh, absolutely, that, that, that is of course in your hands. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we don't want to overlap with the activities of other international bodies. We just want to help and to bring our expertise, uh, including to the United Nations, uh, if it yeah. be possible. Thank you. So Kurt. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, actually, I completely agree. It's too uh, it's too difficult to uh, to get to the moon. It's difficult to uh, to keep humans and and other uh, robotics alive on the moon without uh, without having this uh, interoperability and cooperation. So I think what your proposal is is outstanding. Um, it makes perfect sense. We should uh, we should cooperate, create these best practices such that something built in the United States could work uh, very easily with something built in Japan and, uh, and we can share spare parts perhaps uh, across. I think it's a great, uh, a great activity. It also again f leads towards a, a more peaceful cooperation amongst the nations of the world. And I think that's what the moon and space exploration should be about. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Dan, do you have an opinion or a comment? Yeah, I agree completely. I think, uh, as mentioned earlier, I think Kirk had said it best that um, you know, no one organization or country is going to be able to make lunar activities possible on their own. Uh, and in order to really facilitate uh, cooperation to make that a possibility and, and make it as, as realistic as possible, um, these are exactly the kinds of measures. And I know that working with an international customer base um, from around the world, I think it would be uh, very much welcomed by all the payload uh, builders that we're working with right now. Thank you very much. So our time is over. I want to thank all panelists uh, for your uh, outstanding contribution to this uh, workshop uh, and symposium, global workshop and symposium. And uh, I hope uh, you will continue to keep in touch with us and to bring your expertise in our work as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the organizers and the staff who ensure the connection and uh, all logistics uh, for for our workshop thank you bye bye thank you bye. thank you thank you indeed bye thank you to all our speakers 
panelists and moderators. With this, we conclude the day one of the first online Global Moon Village workshop and symposium. Please don't forget to visit our virtual stands where representatives from the companies featured will be available to answer any of your questions for the next two hours.